So we know that definitional approaches to categorization don't really work. Not all the members of a category are easily defined by some simple rule. So psychologists decided mm, that's not going to work because, for example, if you looked at all those pictures of different kinds of dogs, it's hard to imagine what rule you could develop to define all of them as dogs. I mean, look at an a Irish wolfhound versus a, a teacup poodle. They couldn't be more different, and yet they're both dogs. So what is it about them? Well, psychologists use this concept of family resemblance. Um, and the benefits of family resemblance is that uh, it allows for variation, right? So if I ask, what is a chair? Uh, a chair isn't defined by the presence of any particular feature, but by the fact that it sort of resembles other chairs. Uh, if you have, think about members of your family, you don't all look alike but there are certain resemblances that are shared. You and your sister may look similar in some ways and you and your parents may look similar in others, but there is some resemblance. Now, uh, one type of categorization that gets a lot of attention, especially every year that there's an Olympics, is the difference between men and women. Most people think it's a very simple, straightforward question. You're either a man or you're a woman, and it should be easy to tell. But it turns out sex and gender are kind of complicated. So gender, of course, gender is determined by your genes, right? XX versus XY, your genitalia, your internal genitalia, as well as your external genitalia, your hormones, your behaviors, and also your internal feelings. The question is, that's a lot of variables. What do we have? Six different variables there. What if some of those variables say you're female and other variables say you're male? Then what category in a simple two category world do you fit in? Well, neurophysiology now suggests to us that gender is really a continuum. It's not two separate bins or categories. It's a complicated continuum. And if you think I'm exaggerating, the Olympics still cannot define gender. In fact, in their latest iteration of what defined gender, they just excluded the woman who holds the world record in various track meets. So family resemblance. Turns out there's two types of theories that fall under the umbrella or category of family resemblance. Prototype theories and exemplar theories. Prototype, exemplar. Let's start with prototype. Prototype theory is the following. The idea is if you see a lot of something, several instances of the same thing, that in your mind you will create the most typical version of that category. So if you see a lot of cars, in your mind you'll create the most perfect car, the most typical car. And decisions about whether something is a member of a particular category, according to prototype theory, is how well does that thing match your prototype? So for example, let's assume, for the sake of argument, that my prototype of a bird looks like this. And then I see a little chick. And the question is, is that chick a bird? Well, I would compare that chick to my internal prototype or idea of the perfect bird and decide based on that whether or not the chick was a bird or not. Exemplar theory, you can think of exemplar theory as just example theory. Exemplar theory, there's no prototype created. There's no idealized version. Instead, in exemplar theory, what your brain uses is every single example of every member of that category. And so when you're making a decision, for example, about that same chick, according to exemplar theory, what I'll do is go through in my mind every single example of every bird I've ever seen and compare each of them to the chick. And if one matches, then the chick is a bird. And if nothing matches, then the chick is not a bird. So let's continue with the bird example. Uh, if you use the US in general, maybe the most prototypical bird would be, I guess, a robin or maybe a wren. Um, in LA, I'm not so sure. 
maybe a seagull in LA would be the prototypical bird. Those would be classic birds. What's the most bird-like bird you can imagine? It's not going to be an ostrich or a penguin or a flamingo. Those are not prototypical birds. Those are unusual birds. I want the most usual example. That's a prototype. So according to prototype theory, if my idea of the most bird-like bird is a wren, then I'll have in my mind a wren, and I'll compare that wren to everything that I'm trying to categorize. So I might look at a seagull, and it's like, well, seagulls like a wren. Yeah, close enough, it's a bird. Or a chicken, mm, not so sure, that's a little harder, but maybe. An airplane, mm, maybe not. Prototype theory. Prototype theory has an advantage over the classic definitional theory of categorization in that it can deal with typicality effects. So in the classic definitional approach to categorization, the fact that some things are really typical members of a category and other things are atypical members of the category, that's lost. You can't handle typicality at all. But in prototype theory, you can handle typicality effects. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's say that that P is my prototype for a chair. Okay, that's my the most cherry chair I can think of. Uh, from that chair, there are going to be lots of examples of other chairs, and they're going to be more or less distant from my prototype. If something is close to my prototype, then the dot would be close to that letter P. If something is far away from my prototype, like in the far right here, there's a horrible example of a desk chair that has these spikes coming out of it. Yeah, it's a chair, but it's really far away from my prototypical chair, right? So this is the typicality effect. This also gets to the fact that category membership is graded in the sense of typicality, graded by the fact that some things are really great examples of chairs and others, like that spiky chair, they're very atypical, right? They're unusual. Now, evidence that you create prototypes naturally come from the following demonstration. Uh, from Mike Posner's lab. We're going to do that in a minute. And what you'll see is even if I don't tell you what defines a category, you are spontaneously going to create a prototype of that category in your head. Here we go. Okay, here is the Posner and Kiel demo. And what you're going to see on various trials are collections of dots. And on each trial, you'll see a collection of dots, and you have to categorize that collection as either being part of category A or part of category B. Now, at the beginning, you're just going to have to guess, um, but it, after each trial, you'll get feedback about whether that was an example of category A or B, and you'll see that your guessing gets better as uh, you get more and more feedback. So here we go. Is that an A or a B? That was a B. A or a B? That was an A. So, so far you're just guessing, okay? A or B? A. A or B? B. A or B? B. A or B? A. A or B? A. A or B? B. A or B? A. A or B? B. Now judge whether or not you've seen the following dot patterns, okay? Is that old or new? Did you see that before? Old or new? Did you see that before? Did you see that one before? How about that one? How about this one? That one? Did you see that one? Old or new? Old or new? It turns out that on the far left here is your prototype of category A. It's the most perfect example of category A that there was. And you created a prototype of category A. One of the stimuli that was presented was the prototype for category A. Now, you never saw the prototype for category A, but I guarantee you 
that you said that you had seen the prototype for category A. This is evidence that we're constructing the perfect example of each category. You did the same thing with uh, category B. As you got more and more experience with category B, you developed a prototype for category B, and then when you were asked whether you had seen an object or not, you were much more likely that you, to say that you had seen the prototype. So if something was actually old, subjects in the study can identify it about 90% of the time. If something was a new and a prototype, then people are just as likely to say that they had seen it before, even though they didn't. We create prototypes and we think we've experienced them. Prototypical objects are judged more quickly than unusual objects. So for example, if I ask you the question, is an apple a fruit? You can answer that very quickly, right? So an apple might be my prototype of a fruit. The most fruity fruit I can think of would be an apple. A pomegranate is a perfectly good fruit, but if you ask me, is a pomegranate a fruit, it turns out it's gonna take me quite a bit longer, on average, 100 milliseconds longer. Psychologists test this idea with something called sentence verification tasks. What is that? Well, there would be a number of sentences and you ask, you give people one sentence at a time and you ask them to just judge the sentence as either true or false. So a sentence could be, a robin is a bird, true. A salmon is a fish, true. A penguin is a bird, true. But notice penguin is atypical, so that takes a little longer. A seagull is a fish, false. An ostrich is a dog, false. An eel is a fish. I guess it is, but it's an unusual fish, right? So that's an example of the sentence verification task. You give people short sentences and you ask them to tell you true or false. And it turns out that people are much faster at sentence verification tasks when they're making judgments about a prototype or a typical member of a category than when they're making judgments about unusual or atypical members of that category. Now, uh, prototype models have advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are that prototypes are really easy to classify and remember, and we spontaneously build prototypes whenever we see several examples of things. But a lot of information is lost. For example, um, I make the prototype, there's no way to know, is that prototype built on a thousand different examples or three? So all that's lost. Um, the variability of a category is lost and the correlations amongst attributes are lost. So for example, it turns out really big birds don't sing, only little birds sing, uh, but there's no way to know that from a prototype model. So um, the other theory is exemplar theory, and exemplar theory is, is a competitor to prototype theory. And the main claims of exemplar theory, and again, exemplar just means example, is that judgments are not based on a prototype, but on whether you can find a match for the item you're trying to classify with one of the many examples of that category that you've actually stored. So there's nothing abstract in exemplar theory. It's all very concrete. And in exemplar theory, um, whether or not something belongs in a category is just simply a function of, does that thing I'm looking at match one of my examples of that category in my memory? So for example, I have a category of dog and a category of cat, and maybe I'm looking at this thing, trying to figure out what is it. I will match that thing to each example of a dog in my memory, and it won't match any of them. And then I'll try to match that thing to each category, each example of a cat that I've seen, and it will match one of them. And so I categorize it as a cat. So in exemplar theory, some new thing is judged according to old remembered, remembered examples of that thing. Here's another example. I'm looking at this big furry thing. How do I figure out what it is? Well, I pull up past examples of dogs and other non-dog things and I see what it matches and whatever it matches best, that's how I categorize it. So exemplar theories can explain um, some aspects of prototype theory 
such as the fact that prototypes also tend to be the most typical examples of an item and typical examples, you'd have a ton of them in your memory. Uh, and exemplar theory can also handle great, the graded nature of categories. And it can explain prototypes. The way it explains prototype effects is by saying that the prototype is most like um, the largest number of exemplars that you're working with, and that's where prototypes come from. But the honest truth is psychologists are still debating prototype theory versus exemplar theory. There's probably something entirely new that explains both sets of effects. But you'll have to come back and take that class in a few years, take this class in a few years to find out that answer. Okay, that's the end of my lecture on categorization.